Okay, so bankruptcy typically begins, let's just talk about before we dive back into our example, now that we have a better understanding of priorities, let's also just spend a little bit of time understanding the bankruptcy process. So the bankruptcy typically begins when the petition is filed by the debtor, when the bankruptcy petition is filed by the debtor, and that's called a voluntary petition in the U.S. under Chapter 7 or Chapter 11. Chapter 7 is your, if you're not hoping to emerge from bankruptcy, you're just trying to have an orderly liquidation, or the more interesting in the, in the subject of our discussion here, Chapter 11, when you're hoping to emerge from bankruptcy is a new sort of going concern, viable going concern. Now, once you file, the automatic stay provisions kick in, where basically it prevents creditors from collecting pre-petition claims without the approval of the court, while post-petition liabilities receive priority uh, treatment over the pre-petition claims, as, as we've talked about, which enables the company to continue to operate. Financing now becomes available to the debtor. Vendors may still provide trade as they receive administrative status. Um, now, just as a, as a reality check, debtors often are managing the timing of the filing to conserve cash before the filing uh, to give the debtor maximum flexibility. So because the debtor is the one that's usually the, filing the, the bankruptcy petition, they're going to do it at a specific point uh, that's most advantageous to them. So what is that point? Well, uh, for example, you may, you may want to do it right before a large required principal repayment, right? So if you see that you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to owe a couple million dollars next week. You know, there's a next, you know, principal installment payment due. I'm going to file right before that, for example. Um, or I'm going to max out all the available cash on my revolving credit line. Again, to just beef up the amount of cash I have before filing for bankruptcy. I may delay payments to vendors knowing that I'm going to be protected by the automatic, um, the automatic stay, right? So... So these are all things that obviously, as you can imagine, infuriate the creditors uh, that are now kind of being held hostage, knowing that the, 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 that the debtor or that the company is going to file for bankruptcy. And, and now you've sort of, you know, rather than being paid out, you're now in, in, the, in the long line of creditors hoping to get partial recoveries. So barring fraud or gross mismanagement, though, management is usually, usually stays post-petition you know, once they're filed, to run the day-to-day -day alongside advisors brought in for support. So the exception would be something like Enron, where there was gross mismanagement, and so the, the management team is kicked out. But usually, just, you know, filing for bankruptcy does not sufficiently warrant getting, warrant getting kicked out, because the, the advantage of keeping management in is that they know where all the skeletons are, so to speak. They've been running the business, and so it's important to kind of maintain some sort of continuity to, to make this an organized restructuring. One thing to point out is that management's fiduciary responsibility, which is traditionally just to equity, right? Usually the responsibility of management is to maximize shareholder value, right? Their responsibility is to the owners of the business. But that fiduciary responsibility actually shifts, certainly once you file for bankruptcy, but actually technically even before you file for bankruptcy, as long as you believe the business is insolvent, it shifts from equity to creditors. And the, the responsibility then of management is to do what's in the best interest of creditors, not equity. So now that we have a better understanding of how the parties might act in court or how they might do in court, let's, re let's redraft our out-of-court restructuring plan. Let's make the following assumptions and then I'll have you take a stab at actually running uh, the numbers of what would be a fair restructuring plan. So let's assume that the appraised value of all the collateral that um, that both the first lien and the second lien debt um, you know, have liens on it equals $200,000. Let's also assume that liabilities should not exceed $340,000 to avoid over leverage. So let's, let's say we've all kind of you know, thought about our business you know, being worth $452,000 as a business that shouldn't be levered beyond $340,000 in total liability value. The second lien is okay with an at least some form of equity recovery, but no one else wants it. You are willing to dilute your own equity ownership down to 5%, right? You as the equity, as the owners, let's say the owner class now that owns 120,000 shares of equity. This will come out of the general unsecured creditors' pockets in proportion to their uh, claims. So just keep in mind that you are not willing to go down to zero or dilute yourself any lower than 5%. 
Below that, you're just not going to participate. You're not going to help. And again, you're the management, so they need you. You can say, look, I'm willing to play ball as long as I keep 5%. Um, and who does that come, whose pocket does that come out of? Well, it's the, the, the higher priority uh, rung are the general unsecured creditors. So it's going to come out of their pocket in proportion to their claims. Okay, so that's the final uh, assumption. Why don't you guys run through a, a viable restructuring plan based on these assumptions here? All right, give that a shot.